Good evening, everyone, and welcome. As many of you know, this lecture sp series spawned from an undergraduate course that I teach here each spring called Science and Food. The goal with my course and with this lecture series is to communicate science, something that is not very intuitive to many of us, using food, which is something that we all know and understand. And now I would like to introduce and welcome tonight's speakers, beginning with Michelin-starred chef Morihiro Onodera. And I'm also delighted to introduce to you Ola Mortsen. Ola is a professor of molecular biophysics at the University of Southern Denmark. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our celebrated speakers to Science and Food. I think the way scientists work in their labs, in many respects, resemble the way chefs work in their kitchens. Uh, even though the, our disciplines are very different, we, we are sort of inspired by the same interest in our environment. In this case, in the kitchen, it's food. In, in, in science, it could also be food, but also other things from, say, from biology. You like sushi? <laughs> Have all of you tasted it? Here's a piece of sushi for you. This is called hand-pressed sushi or nigiri sushi. And it's a piece of rice, hand-formed rice, and on top of that there's, in this case, some raw salmon. And if I ask you, what does the rice taste of? You may say, well, it's sort of sweet, which is correct, because there's some starch in it and some sugars. And then if I ask you again, what else does it taste from? You may remember it tastes actually a little bit salty. It also tastes sour. And, uh, you would ask yourself, how come that rice should taste salt and sour? And this is uh, my first curious question, why does it taste like that? And that's of course the chef has made it sour and salt, but why? It actually reflects on an ancient quote, which is um, my story first, where, what is sushi? And because the history of sushi is really the history of preservation of food. And we tend to forget nowadays where we can fly food from one end of the world to the other, and we have freezers and refrigerators, we have all sorts of fancy techniques to keep the food stuff fresh throughout the day, throughout the seasons, we can transport from one coast to the other coast, but that didn't used to be like that. And throughout uh, Asia, in particular in China and later in Japan, people discovered that you can ferment fish, that is you can preserve fish, by taking fresh fish and put it in layers of cooked rice. So basically you had a big barrel, you cooked rice and put a layer of rice, and put a layer of fish and a layer of rice and so on, and, and a, a lid on the top and a big stone, and you will press this thing down. And what will happen? Well, you know what's going to happen. You get spontaneous fermentation because you have lactic bacteria in the environment. It started, starts fermenting the fish, and after some time it doesn't smell very good but the rice nurtures the, the, uh, the bacteria, and after some time, the fish changes texture, it changes um, uh, taste, it changes odor, but it's still edible and it's nutritious. And maybe after half a year, you could then pull out the fish and eat the fish. That is the original sushi. And in those days, of course, you didn't eat the, eat the rice. It was just to be thrown out. So the history of sushi is really up to nowadays, it's sort of a shortening of fermentation times until now where we basically don't ferment the fish, we eat it raw. Now there's another old quote. Look at the sizes. There's sizes that are bites. You can eat, you're not supposed to, to uh, cut them in two. You put them in the mouth and eat them in one go. And that actually reflects on the fact that sushi used to be fast food. It's something you ate in the street, just like as you go to have a grab a a burger or a sausage or a sandwich in the street. And this is the way it would look in the old Edo, in, 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 in the old Tokyo, uh, in the streets before the big, big earthquake. You have these kiosks outside and the sushi chef would stand there and make the sushi and the, and the busy town people, they would rush by and get the sushi and eat it by the fingers. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the original way of eating sushi. It's small pieces, so that's another um, old code. Now, you talk about sushi, you may think that the really critical thing is the fish and the shellfish, which of course it is. But those of you who made sushi at home realize it's easy to cut a 
nice piece of fish. It's difficult to make the sushi rice. And uh, rice is a grain, and here is, is a grain. It has the structure like other grain. And the rice you use for sushi is a particular kind of rice. And, and, and a little uh, while, um, Morisan is going to tell you about what kind of rice should you choose. Now, if you look inside this rice and the part of it you use for sushi, which is actually the milled part, it's only the uh, inner part here, maybe 60% or 70% of the rice, it's mostly starch. And that's why rice keeps for a very long time, because there's very little fat, there's very little proteins. And of course, there's also a lot of calories, because it's, it's, uh, it's starch. If you look inside the rice, um, you have little granules that are only sort of uh, um, from three to eight microns or three to eight thousands of a millimeter big. And um, in the dry state, they really like little crystals. And what is happening when you cook the rice, you add some water and the water sort of absorbs to the rice and they swell. And the real secret behind the sushi rice is that when they swell, they, these little grains are not supposed to break, because if they break, you get the kind of rice you use for porridge. So there's a layer of proteins around here, and that actually distinguishes the different kinds of rice. But the question is, how do you choose the rice? And that's a whole science in itself. And uh, it's wonderful, um, Maury, that you have developed an interest in, in rice, and so now you're going to tell us. I was born, of course, Japan and northern Japan called Iwate Prefecture. And my family owns all vegetables, like uh, grown vegetables, rice, vegetable, miso, everything. Now I'm crazy about uh, rice, which my hometown has a lot of rice field. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. And this is Kyoko Higo. She will translate my lecture because I don't speak English very well. <laughs> Too bad I didn't uh, attend UCLA. じゃあ始めます。はい。日本での料理人寿司職人に関わらず。so, chefs, not just restricted or limited to sushi chefs, since we're talking about sushi today. Uh, in Japan, they place uh, a very, very high importance on rice, the rice grains itself, but the cooked rice that we consume as our main sort of staple food. And here in the U.S., um, I don't think a lot is really told or shared. Um, sort of dissecting or decoding, as you said, about rice. Um, there's a lot you can read in the media and learn about sushi, but the majority of them talk about the fish, as you just said, Doctor. So most of the rice used um, in sushi restaurants across um, the states are, most of them use the medium grain rice, but some, uh, there are some types of short grain rices that are used. Uh, in, uh, they come from California. In Japan, most sushi restaurants would be using short grain rice. So the photos you see here is a way for me to um, examine or experiment with the various types of rice. Here, um, we experimented two different types. They're both short grain rice. So first, what I do here is I soak the uncooked rice in water and leave it for about 20 minutes. Um, the rice um, may be hard to see, but it turns white. Um, and as it sits in water, and then sometime after 20 minutes, it, it'll start to break. Uh, there's 100 grains of rice here, and then I take a sample, check to see uh, if there are any cracks. Uh, and there's about 10 grains on, on both sides of the slides here. So my sort of guideline when doing this kind of examination is, you know, how many of the grains are being, are, do, do I see cracks or are they starting to break? So out of 100, if I see maybe 10 or less, then it gets my sort of pass or approval. And why I have this sort of 10 out of 100 rule is because um, uh, if I see more cracks uh, taking 10 grains of rice, you can see kind of a light white line around it, and that's the starch that's uh, leaking out from the cracks and that makes the rice very sticky uh, when you start to chew on it and, and bite into it. And so with good rice, which has less cracks or breaks, you're able to feel the texture of each of the grains 
uh, whereas in your mouth, whereas with the, with the lower quality rice, you're going to just get the stickiness. But in the spirit of this initiative, learning about food through science or science about food, I can tell you I'm bringing a research project home inspired by this encounter with uh, Morisan because what we would like to know is, is there any changes in the microstructure? You remember these little starch grains I told you about? The question is, are they differently covered with proteins? What is happening when you soak it with, with water? We have special microscopy techniques that can actually analyze where's the water, where's the protein, and where's the starch. So hopefully, next time I come back here, we'll know why it doesn't crack. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you to all our speakers for a very illuminating and thorough discussion on sushi.